You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to First Peter or Second Peter, sorry, we're, we're done with First Peter. Second Peter, chapter one. As we begin Second uh, Peter today, and we'll be looking at verses one through seven of First Second Peter, chapter one. I think most of us have either said or at least have heard uh, something to the gist of uh, God will always provide for what he calls us to. Or if God calls us to something, then he'll he'll provide for us to do it. And and sometimes that's in reference to something like uh, someone considering going into the mission field. And so, you know, how are we going to provide for our family? How are we going to to make this work out, how are we going to bring things together? Or it may be someone who is uh, in high school and thinking about the college that they want to go to. You know, does God really want me to go there? Well, if he wants me to go to that college, if he calls me to that, well, he'll provide for me to go there. It could be someone, too, uh, considering a career change. And and don't get me wrong as I say this, either. I, I, I'm not saying that there's no truth in this, this phrase. Uh, in this idea. There certainly is, and I think I've said something to the gist of it myself as well. That if God has indeed called us to something, he he will provide for us to accomplish that which he has called us to. Sometimes I think it's used to justify decisions that we know we probably shouldn't make, but you know, if God calls me to it, then, then he'll provide. And, and really, we mean the opposite. That if he doesn't want me to do this, then, you know, then he, he, he won't let it happen. And, you know, so I'm going to move forward with what I want. And then we'll just see how it goes. Um, that, that's not a good way to, to think about this. Uh, but, I, again, this, this, this idea may be used in the context of making a, a big decision or making a risky decision in our lives. But I think that we should think about this, actually, in more practical ways. And especially as we come to our text here for this morning, as uh, we get into the main body of Peter's second letter. We see that, and we've already discussed going through 1 Peter, that we are called to holiness. And sometimes we may struggle with that thought and idea as we, we still wrestle with sin in our own lives. But what we see here in our text for this morning, that since God has called us to holiness... He also provides for us to be holy. And we need to recognize that and understand that. And so, as we begin 2 Peter here, let's read our text here for this morning. Again, starting in verse 1, we'll read through verse 7. Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Now, again, as we begin this letter this morning, and we see here in verse 1, the author identifies himself as Simon Peter, a servant an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, we discussed at the, uh, the, the first sermon, the introduction to this series, going through First and Second Peter, that there has been some dispute about whether Peter really is the author of either of these letters, First or Second Peter. Uh, but really, throughout church history, it's Second Peter that has really come under the most scrutiny, uh, questioning its authenticity. And so we see here, Simon Peter is... In reference to the apostle 
uh, to the one that we see in the Gospels, to the one that we see in the book of Acts. And so this would be referring to the one who also wrote 1 Peter. But again, that has been challenged by some throughout history. And so, being this one that we see in Scripture, Simon Peter, Simon is his given name. But then Jesus gave him the name Peter, or Petros, meaning rock, after he confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he identifies himself here as also a, a servant, at least as the English Standard Version has it, or literally it says a slave. He's a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ, a slave who is obligated to obey his master, Jesus. And as an apostle, he's one of those that have been appointed by Christ to bear witness in the world of Christ and his suffering, and has been therefore delegated with Christ's authority. And again, there are those who question the authenticity of this letter, if it really came from Peter. And some of the questions that get brought up is because as you compare at least 1 Peter with 2 Peter, uh, there's a difference in the style in the Greek that it was written in, and there's different vocabulary uh, that is used uh, in this letter. And, uh, and, and really, we, we've gone over some of the things of, of what the questions are uh, against this letter, and really why, though, those things don't hold water. And why 1st and 2nd Peter have both held up through the test of time and scrutiny. And that there is every reason for us to believe that this is authentic and to take it as this is Peter's letter. This is a letter from the Apostle. Uh, we can stand on that with confidence. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go through those things now, because again, we, we discussed some of those things in the introduction uh, to this series. But this is truly a letter from the Apostle Peter. So, since the letter from him, the next question then is, who is this letter to? And he does not specifically identify his readers uh, in this letter. When we get to chapter 3, verse 1, we'll see here that 2 Peter is the second letter that he has written to those he is sending this one to. And so then if the first letter could be identified as what we read as 1 Peter, then that would mean the audience is the same as 1 Peter. And so that second Peter would then be written to those churches that are scattered throughout Asia Minor. Uh, churches in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia and Bethina. And in 1 Peter there, he calls them chosen. Here he refers to them as those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those who obtain a faith of equal standing. When we come to Christ and are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, we are all on the same level ground together in terms of our faith. Faith that we have obtained, as we see here in verse 1. And the idea that we have obtained this faith, uh, the word here translated in the ESV carries the connotation of receiving a gift, uh, of getting something that we don't deserve. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that the attaining is, is not by one's own effort or as a result of one's own exertion, but is like ripe fruit fallen into one's lap. This faith by which we put trust in Jesus Christ alone to save us is a faith that was given to us as a gift. A faith that was given to us by God and nothing that we have done in of ourselves. This is by his grace. And all who have been given this gift of faith, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've been saved out of in your life, no matter your background and how you serve the Lord in his church, we are all equally saved with the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, credited to us. Credited to us equally. And so therefore we are all equally righteous because we do not stand in our own righteousness. Not one of us do, but we all stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, we should note then here, too, that this verse 
referring to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the way it's written in the Greek demonstrates very clearly the teaching of the deity of Jesus Christ. He is blatantly calling Jesus God here in that verse. Now we see Peter must have written this letter sometime between 64 and 65, or his first letter, excuse me. He wrote his first letter sometime between 64 and 65 AD after Emperor Nero burned Rome to the ground in July of 64 AD, sparking empire-wide persecution against the church. And so Peter wrote his first letter calling the churches to stand firm and be holy in response to that persecution they faced. And so then it seems reasonable to think that Peter must have written this letter shortly before he was martyred by Nero, somewhere between 67 and 68 AD. Matter of fact, when we get to verse 14 of chapter 1, we'll see that when Peter was writing this letter, he expected to die sometime soon. And so some uh, say that he, he may have even wrote this letter while sitting in prison, awaiting his and his wife's crucifixion. And then as we, we come to verse 2, we see Peter's greeting to the churches. Greeting of grace and peace that is multiplied or abound in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Their God refers to God the Father and then Jesus our Lord. And all who believe, all who have been given grace to be saved, and therefore have peace with God. Here Peter is referring to the continuing of, of grace, God's unmerited favor, and the continuing of peace in which we grow in and are sustained in our faith in. This comes to us through the knowledge of God the Father and Jesus our Lord. In this knowledge, sustaining grace and peace is multiplied to us. And this is an important factor as Peter addresses the infiltration of false teaching into the church. In the midst of of suffering, in the midst of persecution, it's no surprise that false teachers would rise up and teaching uh, another way and teaching a a, a way out of suffering and and, and teaching a, a, a easier way in order to draw a following unto themselves. And these false teachers appeared to have risen from within the church, that they had made a profession of faith and then revealed their true colors by their corruption. The context of 2 Peter, uh, by that we can determine that their teaching had something to do with doubting end times theology, specifically doubting the return of Christ and, and therefore denying final judgment. And therefore, then that teaching leads to the teaching of licentious living. That it really doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't really matter uh, if you pursue holiness or not, if you live in obedience to your God. And so we see then Peter addressing these false teachings. And as we then get into the body of this letter, we see that that's where he begins. Should we really live a licentious life, or has God provided for us to live holy lives. So as we come to verse 3 then, we see Peter says here in the ESV, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, The ESV leaves out the conjunction here in verse 3. As we see in the New American Standard Bible, the 95 edition, it says, seeing that, or could also be translated as because his divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And so the conjunction is connecting verse 3 with verse 2. So in other words, Peter could pray for his readers that grace and peace may be multiplied to them in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord because God has already supplied for the believers all that they need in order to live a life that pleases God in order to live a life that honors him, that glorifies him, by growing in reflecting his character in all that they do. Because he has given us all we need for life and godliness. See, the danger is 
that as we continue to wrestle with sin and temptation in our lives, we can draw wrong conclusions. Thinking, you know, I can never really be holy. I can never really grow in holiness. And since salvation is by grace alone and not really based on anything I do anyway, then then there's really no need for holiness in my life. There's really no need for me to pursue holiness in my life. Now, hopefully, even as we've just finished 1 Peter, hopefully that study has already put that notion to rest, that we are called to pursue holiness. Also, too, another pit that we can fall in with this Um, is addressed by John MacArthur when he says, Many find it hard not to think that even after salvation, something is missing in the sanctification process. This faulty idea causes believers to seek second blessings, spirit baptisms, tongues, mystical experiences, special psychological insight, private revelations, self-crucifixion, the deep life heightened emotions, demon bindings, and combination of various ones of all those in an attempt to attain what is supposedly missing from their spiritual resources. All manner of ignorance and scripture twisting accompanies those foolish pursuits. And so do we think that we we need something more given to us? That we should pursue other resources in our lives? My friends, the truth of the matter is, we already have all that we need to live in holiness, to grow in holiness, to live lives that please and honor our God. If we are saved, then we must not still look for God to give us something more, something different. Or worse, we must not look to ourselves for these resources, as if they come from us, because they certainly do not. This power, this provision does not come from us, but we are provided for by the power of God. And we see here that it's by His divine power. Now, there, there's some debate here is when it says His divine power, who is that referring back to? Some argue it's Jesus. Some argue it's God the Father. Others, and, and I think this is where I lean, say that Peter could have purposely left this ambiguous, and so we should too. Um, Because really, could this be referring to Jesus? Absolutely. Does it fit? Yeah. Could it be referring to God the Father? Yeah. Could it be even referring to both in its ambiguity? Yeah, I think so. But what we do know that this is the power of God that is supplying for us what we need. And so in in any case, you might ask, how how do we experience that power then? How do we experience it if I already have all that I need? If if I have everything to pursue holiness, why do I I not experience the defeat of sin in my life? Why, Why have I not experienced any victory in my life over sin? Well, we see this provision comes to us through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And when it talks about this call, this call of God to his own glory and excellence, this is referring to the call of salvation, by which God awakens dead hearts to repent and believe the gospel. Calling all he saves to his own glory and excellence it is calling us by the revelation of himself. And this is true, again, whether we're talking about God the Father or Jesus Christ. Remember, when we talked about evangelism before, and we talked about what is it to preach the gospel and to walk away from a conversation saying that we, we preach, we share the gospel with somebody, uh, one of the things we've talked about is starting with who God is. Who is God? How has how the scriptures revealed him? We see God's revealing of his majestic glory We see the revealing of the glories of Christ as the eternal Son of God. We see God's God's high standard of what is good and righteous in the gospel proclamation as we hold up God's law, his law which reveals sin, shows us that we have not met that standard ourselves. 
Uh, that, that law that revealed God's own character in his perfect holiness. And as we see that we have not met up to that standard that is set in God's law, as people humble themselves under that law to say, I'm, I'm not really good within myself. I have broken God's law. Every time I've not put God first in my life, with every lie that I have spoken, with every lustful glance that I have given, uh, with, with every grudge that I've held on to, I have not upheld God's standard. I have broken his law and have only earned wrath for myself. When someone humbles themselves under his law, we point them to Jesus Christ. We point them to Jesus as their righteousness, as Jesus is the payment for their sins. That if they trust in him, they will find that their, their debt has been satisfied. That Christ took on himself what they deserve when he went to the cross to pay for their sins. That he is the perfect sacrifice, satisfied God's justice in their place. He died for sinners. He died, but he did not stay dead. He rose again. And he's alive today. And the gospel response is to repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and put your faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And then we see here our sanctification, our growth in maturity and walking with him to please him is in the knowledge of him. This knowledge includes head knowledge, intellectual knowledge. It includes that. It, it includes the, the affirmation of certain truths about God, absolutely, but it, that's not all it is. It's not just head knowledge. It's also personal or relational knowledge. So our salvation and our, our being empowered and, and all his provision comes in knowing the God who calls us, the God who saves us. It comes in our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. So my friends, if you're saying that you find your life powerless to fight against your sin, to be putting your sin to death, then I guess my question is, do you know this God? Has he called you by his grace? Have you really heard the gospel and believed on Jesus alone for your salvation? Not believing in anything of yourself, not trusting in anything about you, but trusting Jesus and what he has done and who he is to save you and make you right before God. Have you put your faith in Jesus? And my friends, if you have, if you know this God, this God of majestic glory, this God of excellent moral character, then he has divine, then his divine power has granted to you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, the knowledge of him who calls you, calls you to his own glory and excellency. You just must believe it. Believe that he has already given you everything you need and turn around and live in response. Live out pursuing holiness. Then uh, verse 4 starts by saying, by which, or it could also be translated by through these. Well, what are these? Through, through what? And I think that the most logical choice is that these refers back to God or Christ's own glory and excellence. Through his glory, through his excellence, he has given us his precious and very great promises. And what are these promises? Well, we could, we could look back to what was said in 1 Peter. And we could say, well, maybe this is referring to the, the living hope in which we've been born again into. Uh, that this is having an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, or we could go through every passage of Scripture that reveals what God has promised to us in salvation and say that really Peter is referring to everything here. And, and that, that very well may be true. Matter of fact, that, that is where I lean. I, I think he's referring to every promise of salvation. Uh, that we have because we've trusted in Jesus Christ. But, Peter really does not specifically say what he's specifically referring to here in these promises. 
And really, what these promises all are referring to is not really the point. Uh, The point is, why has God given us these great and precious promises? Well, he's given them to us for his purpose. He's given them to us that we may partake in or share in the divine nature. And saying that we share in the divine nature doesn't mean that we become divine, that we become God, um, but that we share in what is of the divine nature, what is of God's character and the nature of Christ, uh, specifically that we share in his holiness, that we are growing in the image of Christ, growing in holiness. And this is through his promises, through all we have to look forward to because Jesus has saved us. We are motivated, we are empowered to live pursuing holiness, to grow in it until one day Jesus comes for us and takes us to be with him. And and then we see him as he is, and, and because we see him as he is, we then become like him. That as he is complete and and completely holy, we too then will become complete and holy as he is. We look forward to that day. So we are those who share in the divine nature. And I don't believe that Peter is referring to just a future idea here, a future living. But he's referring to a life that begins even now. And it's clear that this is referring to holiness. Again, as as we share in the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And we have, in coming to Christ for salvation, already escaped the corruption of the world. The corruption of because of sinful desire. And we see that, I think, in even what we've already gone through here in this passage. We see that God has given us everything we need to put off sin, to be killing sin, to no longer love our sin and be enslaved to our sin. Because we know Jesus. Because we know God the Father through Jesus Christ. We have escaped. So on one hand, we have already escaped. And on another hand, we are in the process of escaping. And because what exactly is the corruption that's in view here that we've escaped? Uh, Some argue it's death in judgment, which I I think there there is some merit to that argument. Uh, But one, in the context of the false teachers and what they were teaching in, in licentious living, I think it's best to say that the corruption is really the increase of sin. And so our escape is the renouncing, the repenting of sin. We do not follow the world down the paths of sin and wickedness that it goes down. Again, I think what also supports this is the fact that this corruption is due to sinful desire. Mankind desires his perversions. He desires his greed and his, his twisted pleasures. He is full of pride and all kinds of idolatry. And so his corruption is his sin born out of the desires that are already within him. His lying, his cheating, his lust, his fraud, his hate, his vengeance, his gossip. As the world sinks deeper and deeper into its corruption, the one whom God has saved by his grace, the one who knows God has divine power for all they need for a life that pleases God, having been given promises that they would partake in the divine nature. And so we do begin to partake in the divine nature right at the moment we're saved. That right in that moment, we are no longer who we used to be. And one day we will be completely and fully holy, just like Jesus, when we see him as he is. And so let me ask, what should then keep you in your sin? 
Uh, what should keep you in habitual lifestyle of feeding your lust and greed and pride? Uh, what would keep you from doing what you must to put sin to death in your life? If you know God, His divine power has supplied all you need to do this. But if you're looking to your own strength, then sure, you won't succeed. You will not see victory in your life. Or if you have not truly trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have not recognized you are a sinner deserving of God's wrath and eternal hell, and so turn to Jesus Christ alone to be saved, then too, you will not find this life of victory. You will have no power over your sin. You remain a slave to your sin. But if you have trusted in Jesus Christ alone to save you, then you must stop looking to yourself or anything about you to deal with your sin. But recognize all you need for victory comes from God. All you need to live a life that pleases Him, He has already provided for you in the knowledge of Him. So therefore, live to please Him. Now, this is why Peter says in verse 5, for this very reason, uh, for the very reason that his divine power has given all you need for godliness with great promises, for this very reason, make every effort, do everything you must uh, to the utter extent in order to grow in the divine nature. Do your part in obedience and pursue holiness, pursue sanctification. And Peter here says, you do that by supplementing or by, by supplying or, or adding to your faith that already exists. You know, the faith that we've already seen is a gift from God. Uh, the faith that you exercise by placing faith in Jesus to be saved by grace alone. You are to supplement. You are to add to. that. This is your part. Again, as, as we've seen going through verses 3 and 4, it makes it clear that we can only pursue sanctification because of God's grace. You know, apart from what he supplies, what he provides for us, apart from his work in us, we cannot have victory over our sin. So it's the work that he does in us, and yet we have responsibility as well. We are to pursue our sanctification. We have responsibility in that we will not be sanctified apart from our own obedience. And yet, it's because of the work of God in us. And he gets all the credit and all the glory. And so we see these, uh, these characteristics, these, uh, uh, as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, these ingredients of the Christian life. Uh, we see these things listed out here. And, uh, and we're going to go through them here pretty quickly. Uh, but we're going to also, then next week, uh, touch on them again a little bit uh, further. And so, uh, so w again, we're going to go through this quickly here. As we see these characteristics that are, are to build on one another, to be added to one another. And so we see this list here, and clearly this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, nor is there any great significance to the order of these qualities in this list. Uh, many commentators point out that what Peter is doing is he's using a, a popular literary device in, in how he connects these virtues together. And so of these virtues in this list, we see the first one is virtue. The first characteristic is virtue or moral excellence. Uh, this is the same excellence of character that we see in verse 3, referring to God's excellence, this moral goodness, uh, the very standard of, of God and, and his character of righteousness. That righteousness that on our own we could never measure up to. We are to add this, though, to our faith. We are to pursue this excellence. You know, this is really no different than Peter referring to Leviticus in his first letter, saying that we are to be holy as he who called us is holy. 
The next, Peter says to add knowledge. And Peter uses a different word here for knowledge than he's used earlier, and I think he does that to make a distinction. That he's not referring to here the knowledge of God, in which we find all that we need for life and godliness. But as Douglas Moo points out, he says this likely refers to specifically to the ability to discern God's will and orient one's life in accordance with that will. And so then I would argue then this discernment and, and being able to orient one's life is, is then the knowledge of truth, truth from God's word. Knowing God's word, hiding his word in our heart, being able to apply God's word, this, this truth to our lives. This is that knowledge. Next, we are to supply self-control. You'll not have this knowledge of discernment and, and orienting your life around God's will without self-control. Self-control means saying no to temptation. It means being disciplined in our lives, not being led by our emotions or our sinful desires, but practicing restraint, choosing obedience to our God instead of our sinful desires. Then the next virtue is steadfastness or endurance. In the face of trials, in the face of persecution and false teaching, we must have endurance. True saving faith is a steadfast faith. If one turns from the faith, if when Christ judges the living and the dead, if, if in the end you are not saved, then you are never truly saved to begin with. True saving faith is an enduring faith. Endurance is necessary to stand firm and take up the battle to be faithful to the end. And then the next quality is godliness, or sometimes translated as piety. This is actually, again, the same word that we see in verse 3 that's translated there as godliness. And it's a word that refers to reverence or sometimes proper worship and in our daily living it's it's living to please god such worshipful living such godliness is what all believers have been equipped for god giving us everything we need so that we can add godliness this virtue to our lives to the ingredients of what makes up our christian life and then we're to add brotherly affection. And we've seen Peter already call for us to have love for one another as a family, because we are indeed a family. We are of the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we are to have humility towards one another, serve one another as a family would. We are to have each other's backs and be with each other through thick and thin, being committed to each other. And then lastly to this Brotherly affection, this family affection, we are to add love. Again, we, we do this by putting our brothers and sisters before ourselves. Matter of fact, as, as believers, if we truly do love God and desire to please God with our lives, then that will result in love for one another, in love and all that we do for each other. And so these are the things that Peter says. That this is what makes up the Christian life. Uh, this is what it looks like in our pursuit of holiness and growing. And so, my friends, what is there to keep you, to keep any of us from pursuing these character qualities in our lives? If we're saved, if we know God, then we know we have all that we need to pursue these things. And when we recognize we have not been living any one of these char character qualities out, we repent. And we make these things the practice of our lives. Not because we're trying to earn anything from God, not that, not that this is the way we get to heaven or that we get blessed from God, because really we can't earn anything from God. We've already broken his law. In of ourselves, we are only earning of his wrath and death. 
And if we're trusting in Christ, we know Christ has already earned everything for us. Christ has already earned for us eternal life, our place in heaven, and everything that God has promised to give us through Jesus Christ. Christ has earned that for us. We can't earn it. No, but because we know this God, because we know such, such, such how great the salvation that he has provided for us is, we know how glorious he is, we, we want to please him in our lives. We see that he is worthy of that. If we know him, we, we want to, we do. And if we know him, we have all that we need in order to live to please him. And so we shouldn't look for something more. Uh, nor should we have the excuse of why we don't pursue him. If we're not growing in holiness, if we're not pursuing our sanctification, if we're not growing in these character, qual character qualities, uh, we shouldn't say, well, you know, if I only had this or that. You know, if I only grew up in a Christian home and so had a better foundation, that, then I'd be able to grow in holiness. You know, if my, if my spouse was only holier, you know, if my kids only, only obeyed better, you know, that, then I, I'd be able to grow in holiness. If I only had more time to study the scriptures which really, we, we've talked before, that's not really a time issue, it's a priority issue. But if I only had this, if I only had that, then, then I'd be able to grow in holiness, then I'd be able to, to, to do battle with my sin. No. <laughs> that's not the case. That's just an excuse. If you know God, if you have been saved by grace through Jesus Christ, then you have everything you need. God has already provided for you. And so all you have to do then is turn around believing that and so live it out. Pursue holiness. No, he's given you everything. That it's all in his strength and his power. And don't look to anything about you. Look to him. Trust in him. So let us live demonstrating the power of God, the divine power in our lives that our lives would shine a light on God's greatness, on his power, on his truth, the truth that we profess to believe. If we believe it, then it should affect how we live. And so we should indeed live it out. Seek to possess these qualities. And, and again, we're not talking about perfection here. When we get to verse 8 next week, that'll make it very clear. We're talking about growing in these qualities. And so let us seek to grow in these qualities in increasing measure, living effectually for God's glory and bearing fruit in our lives in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has indeed provided for us. We can truly say that if he calls us to something, if he has called us to holiness, which he has, then he will provide for us to pursue that holiness. And we can know and trust that he's going to bring us all the way through to when he brings us to himself, and we will be holy. And so we should pursue that holiness now. In light of all of the promises he has given to us, let that motivate us and energize us to pursue those things now. Believing and knowing that he has given us everything we need for life in Godliness. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com.